Hello, welcome to Item Not Found, Accounting for Loss in Libraries, Archives, and Other Heritage and Memory Organizations. We are very excited to uh, have you join us today. We're just getting our slides set up, thank you. The Center for 17th and 18th Century Studies and Clark Library acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Hanuk Vatam, Ahihiram, and Iu Hinkum, past, present, and emerging. Oakland University resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, known as the Three Fires Confederacy, comprised of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. The land was ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit and makes up Southeast Michigan. In recognizing the history and respecting the sovereignty of Michigan's Indian nations, Oakland University honors the heritage of indigenous communities and their significant role in shaping the course of this region. Further, we recognize the wrongs done to those forcibly removed from their homelands and commit to fostering an environment of inclusion that is responsible to the needs of First Peoples through our words, policies, and actions. The preservation and or perpetuation of customs and traditions of indigenous nations are essential to our shared cultural heritage. A deep understanding of native peoples past and present informs the teaching, research and community engagement of the university in its ongoing effort to elevate the dignity of all people and serve as shared stewards of the land. Welcome again to the first day of our joint conference, Item Not Found, Accounting for Loss in Libraries, Archives and Other Heritage and Memory Organizations. From the William Andrews Clark Memorial Library at UCLA, we are Anna Chen, Head Librarian, Rebecca Fenning Marshall, Manuscript and Archives Librarian, and Nina Schneider, Rare Books Librarian. From Oakland University's Kresge Library in Rochester, Michigan, uh, we are Molly McGuire, Digital Strategies Librarian, and Emily Spoonagle, Rare Books Librarian. And before we get started, we would like to thank David Eng and Alejandro Sanchez Nunez at the Clark Library, and Eric Bowman, Jeanette Levere, Candace Snowdy, Alistair Thorne, and Bronwyn Wilson at the Center for 17th and 18th Century Studies. This conference wouldn't be what it is without their tremendous work and support behind the scenes. Next, a few quick best practices for the day. We are excited about using this conference to foster generative dialogue on topics that might not always be easy to chat about in our daily spaces. So please feel free to share your thoughts and reactions in the chat. If you have a question for the speakers, please put those in the Q&A feature. We will monitor both the chat and the Q&A, but your questions will be easier for us to see when they're in the Q&A. We also want to remind everyone about our code of conduct. In order to provide a mutually respectful conference environment, harassing, discriminatory, and demeaning conduct is prohibited. We reserve the right to take appropriate action, including removal from the conference in response to unacceptable conduct. So you might be wondering why a Los Angeles-based special collections library specializing in 17th and 18th century materials has partnered with a public doctoral research institution in Greater Metro Detroit. We're excited to share in our introductory remarks the history that brings hundreds of us together today. This story starts with the Marguerite Hicks Collection of Women's Writing held at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. Marguerite Hicks collected over 1,000 books by and about British women writers of the 17th through 19th centuries, forming what is likely one of the first intentional collections of women's writings in America. 
Her collection has been at OU since 1971, but only recently have its broadsides, disbound plays, first editions, and publisher boards been brought out for student instruction, research, and campus exhibits. Since 2017, I've been working to learn more about Marguerite Hicks and her remarkable collection um, with Dr. Megan Pizer, professor of English at Oakland University. And we've learned that Hicks was a queer, widowed, and blind Detroiter who also who worked with her partner of 40 years, Thelma James, to build the collection. Our research also revealed through conversations with our archivist, Dominique Daniel, combined with institutional lore from retired librarians, that many valuable books were discovered missing from OU Special Collections in 1983, not unlike the spate of heists around the country during the early 1980s. Hicks's collection in particular was heavily impacted. What had her collection looked like before its most valuable highlights had mysteriously disappeared? 35 years later, sifting through the filing cabinets in the university archives, I found that Oakland still had some essential pieces that filled in missing information. The shelf list cards of heisted books, internal reports, and lists of the missing items, newspaper clippings and police reports, and importantly, the inventory of books that Marguerite Hicks has sold to Oakland University in 1971, typed up by Marguerite herself. And there it is on the, the right-hand side. These pieces, put together suggested that the previous iteration of the Hicks collection had been had very different strengths. By the 1940s, Marguerite Hicks had put together one of the most impressive collections of materials relating to the 18th century publisher, novelist, and playwright Eliza Haywood. In particular, Hicks had collected this 1742 manuscript in Haywood's own handwriting, acknowledging her translation work for the novel La Sofa, or The Sofa, A Moral Tale, into English. While the title page of the 1742 translated novel does not acknowledge the translator, this receipt definitively attests to Haywood's creative labor. On the list of, of heisted items, this holograph manuscript stood out as unique and likely the easiest to trace. In the 35 years between the heist and this present moment of discovery, technology had proved in our favor, namely the advent of the World Wide Web. A few simple searches identified that an eerily similar item was now in the Clark Library's holdings at UCLA. After confirming as many bibliographical points as I could between the catalog record, Patrick Spedding's 2004, A Bibliography of Eliza Haywood, and the array of circumstantial evidence in Oakland's archives, the real hard work began, deciding what to do with this discovery. How do you approach an institution to suggest that your looted item is in their possession? In November two, uh, 2018, Oakland University made our first contact with the Clark Library, and it wasn't an easy email to write. We were lucky that Anna Chen, head librarian of the Clark Library, responded with interest, concern, and care. Meanwhile, over at UCLA, at the same time that OU was working on the Hicks Collection, we were planning for a conference here at the Clark with UCLA professor Johanna Drucker on the topic of sustainability in special collections, which was held in 2020. And one of the topics that came up repeatedly in the course of that event was the impossibility for cultural heritage workers to save everything and the importance of making peace with letting things go. And we thought that this might be fertile ground for a follow-up conference on loss and impermanence. And we began talking about the many ways that a conference on this topic could go. And unbeknownst to us at the time, this would have many resonances with our conversations with OU. After initially receiving OU's email, we took a closer look at the Haywood manuscript and consulted our acquisition records. And it quickly became clear that the Haywood manuscript at the Clark was indeed the same one from Oakland University. But what to do with this information? OU had noted in their original email that they did not want the manuscript back but we met with UCLA legal counsel anyway to talk about our options and the potential return of the manuscript. And we entered our first meeting with OU prepared to work on this, although with some anxiety, since our conversation with legal counsel suggested that um, given the many administrative layers of our large university, it wasn't likely that we were going to be able to proceed with a quick return, regardless of willingness to send it back to OU. For OU's part, uh, we were going into this meeting hoping that, at least, our detective work was correct and that we hadn't offended the Clark Library by suggesting they'd stolen our manuscript. The meeting was a pleasant surprise uh, with more mutual excitement than either institution anticipated. 
During this first meeting together, Oakland uh, proposed and the Clark supported a series of shared goals. Celebrating Marguerite Hicks through a symposium or digital exhibit, attributing Hicks as the collector of the Haywood manuscript 40 years before the feminist recovery movement, working together to investigate the path that the Haywood manuscript took between Oakland and the Clark, involving students in the discovery process, uh, investigating ways to use technology to digitally reunify and recreate Marguerite Hicks's collection, and importantly, setting an example to the larger profession of transparently doing justice to these inadvertently rehomed items and their original collectors. This conference is one product of our collaboration, and we have made productive headway on most of the other shared goals. We want to emphasize here that the choices that we made about how to work together don't and shouldn't apply to all stolen items. Repatriation of items looted as acts of cultural and colonial violence should be non-negotiable. This particular theft, though, as we see it, is not directly enmeshed in the structures of imperialism. The structures of capitalism, on the other hand, um, there is much to be said about that. In fact, there are productive parallels between the two namesake collectors in terms of their queer identities and privileged class statuses. Hicks, after the death of her husband, moved in with her partner, Thelma James, and built a life together for 40 years. Clark, after the death of his second wife, met his partner, Harrison Post, who would go on to work by his side at the Clark Library. Hicks and James's queer story was completely redacted from the narrative told about Hicks's collection. Clark and Post were never photographed together and their relationship was uh, similarly hidden from official retellings of the Clark Library's history until recently. Part of our rationale at present for not seeking the manuscript's return comes in the form of creating, highlighting and celebrating those productive traces between the two collections. Michelle Caswell, Ricardo Pundalon, and TK Sangwan note in their essay on critical archival studies that, quote, naming is power, naming is a way of demarcating and defining and delineating and harnessing, end quote. For us, this naming looks like a few things. First, Paul Preeb from UCLA Library created a Library of Congress um, name authority record for Marguerite Hicks. This authority record makes it possible to add an additional access point to catalog records for materials written by or related to Hicks, and has the potential to connect Hicks-related materials across libraries. This authority record can connect other heisted Hicks's items, should any other be traceable, back to OU and to UCLA. An authorized name record for Hicks is a way to, at long last, acknowledge her collecting prowess, and is one way in which we can begin the reparative work of recognizing her as a collector and scholar. While librarians and archivists keenly understand that silences, erasures, and injustices are perpetuated, perpetuated sorry, in organizational structure, there's also room in the catalog for starting reparative work. Emily Jabrinsky holds that a queer approach to the problem of library classification and cataloging demands that these reflections of ideology be left as remnants in the structure and that librarians be prepared to teach students how to read what they discover in the text, that is the knowledge organization system itself. By adding this name authority to the catalog record of the manuscript at the Clark Library and to the catalog records of the Hicks collection at Oakland University, thanks to Jeff Johnson and Sean Lombardo, we retain the structures of dubious provenance and draw attention to the queer kinship forged between these two institutions. Further, Oakland University is now able to preserve a digital surrogate of the manuscript in OU Library's digital preservation system and provide access to the digital surrogate in online collections. The digital realm offers opportunities to explore virtual reunification of Hicks' original collection, even though materials may be geographically dispersed. A tragedy 35 years ago then has generated teachable moments digital objects, and a profession-wide conversation about British women writers, rare book provenance, and women and queer book collectors that span 300 years. We know that there are many opinions about theft, ownership, and collection security. We appreciate that the path we've taken so far has allowed us to have these conversations, including an expansive one through today's conference, and that only achieve many of the goals that Emily, Dominique, and I had set out at the outset, but also chart future goals that we didn't predict at the time.
before we went into our first meeting with each other, we didn't know what to expect because none of us had ever been in this position before. This process is usually pretty opaque and not always openly discussed. And one of our goals for this presentation and this conference is to make our thought process and choices more transparent and accessible. Loss is complex. Every experience of theft and loss is different. Uh, and we don't mean to say that our approach is right for every situation. But in our case, loss created a productive space for us. The work we've done together that has come out of the Haywood theft is at least in part due to the way that Oakland framed what was lost and what they wanted to gain back. Returning the Haywood manuscript to Oakland will always be on the table. And in the meanwhile, this conference is a reparative act. <clears throat> At the same time, much like the initial contact between OU and Clark librarians, it has become a sustained and wide ranging collaboration. This conference is also about more than theft and restitution. It also provides a space to explore issues related to loss in much broader and conceptual ways, including those that grew out of the Clark Library Sustainability Conference in 2020. Over this two day conference, we'll hear from speakers exploring not just the loss of physical objects, but the loss of resources and support at all levels and the knowledge that goes with them. In the first panel, we consider change and sustainability, both in terms of our collections and our environment. What happens to collections when their reasons for being collected and their funding run out? What's the impact of climate change on our work? The second panel explores archival silences and those impacts on scholarship, labor, and the preservation of materials. How is scholarship and knowledge production affected if some of the information is missing? Tomorrow, we're going to take a closer look at personal legacies and human loss. How do we address the loss of colleagues, family members, and the context of collectors' histories within our institution? And finally, we'll explore archival and library inadequacies. It's impossible to prevent loss. At the same time, not all loss is negative. When is it important to mitigate loss? And when should we acknowledge that the best approach is to understand it and to accept it? To give us a way into starting to think about some of these questions, it is my great pleasure to introduce Tamar Evangelistia Doherty, Director of the Smithsonian Libraries. As director, Tamar oversees 137 employees, a national advisory board of 15 members, an annual budget of over $16 million, and 22 library branches and reading rooms located in Washington, DC, New York City, Maryland, Virginia, and the Republic of Panama. She's also a faculty member at the UCLA California Rare Book School. Previously, Tamar was an associate li university librarian at Cornell University, where she initiated Cornell RAD, a research hub for rare and distinctive collections. As director of collections and services at New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture from 2013 to 2014, Tamar led collection and pr programmatic development of five curatorial divisions. At the University of Chicago's Black Metropolis Research Consortium, she served as executive director from 2011 to 2013 and as consulting archivist from 2007 to 2011, where she successfully led initiatives to discover and make accessible archives related to the African-American diaspora. In addition to her extensive work with rare and distinctive collections, Tamar is a published author and public speaker who has presented nationally on topics of inclusivity and equity in bibliography, administration, and primary source literacy. Today, she will be speaking to us on the topic, Let Them Research Cake, exploring loss, lessness, and the spirit of abstraction in narrative building and practices of collecting. Thank you, Tamar, for taking the time to address us today. And I will turn things oh, over to you. Sorry, I'm having a share issue. Give me one second. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. Can any, can everyone see my presentation? No, not yet. How about now? Thumbs up. Thank you, Anna, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here 
And um, I want to start off by asking question before I delve into uh, my keynote. Uh, much was decided about the collections that we steward and the repositories that we work at. But I want you to answer this question at the end of uh, my keynote. Do you recall the first item you found in the archive that moved you? How are you looking at that same item today and how does it play into your daily practice? The concept for my keynote was conceived from a memory I had of a rare book school class and administrating special collections. And I want to also preface um, my remarks by saying that my views on um, the way the repositories that I worked at collected um, are not necessarily representational of the people who worked there in the past, um, present or future, but these are my opinions. Um, it was the year 2004 during a time in which the importance of the capital cultural heritage and special collections was being noticed. Furthermore, the fragility of our collections led to deep discussions of our newfound superpower to digitize. And many manuscript curators focused on the rapid expansion of collection scopes. Like the supermodels of the 80s, bold, blonde, black, tall, and beautiful, there were super collectors in libraries. It was a time of the robber barons in special collections, the ransom centers, the Huntingtons, the Beinecke's, the Columbia's, New York Public Library, and other large repositories were adding to their collections and often in competition with one another. At the time I was early in my career and fortunate to witness with my own eyes what loss represented. Columbia University libraries fiercely wanted the Malcolm X papers. The papers of the slain civil rights leader were discovered in a storage facility rented by Malika Shabazz, one of Malcolm X's six daughters. Due to lapsed payments on the rental contents of the storage unit, the papers were put up for sale and purchased by a name named James Calhoun, who wanted to auction them off. And that was when I began to see that researchers consume what we collect and the consumerism and commodification around collections. Butterfield Auction House in San Francisco and eBay billed this sale as the most significant collection of Malcolm X material ever brought to the auction market. Outraged and armed with legal support, the Shabazz family bought, brought the sale to an end. There was still the question of where the collection would find a home. Columbia University Library, rare book and manuscript repository where I worked, wanted to be that home and was particularly driven by the will and work of Dr. Manny Marable, who you see in this photograph, and his team of students working on an oral history project around the legacy of Malcolm X. However, Howard Dodson, then director of the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, was quite resourceful and, and skilled at acquiring papers in his own right, and the collection landed at NYPL on permanent loan for 75 years. This defeat reverberated deeply within the Columbia repository. I was remorseful at the effects of the loss for my colleagues, but also my own sense of loss because the collection I cared for when I was a Lehman curator for American political history was related in some ways to civil rights within the Malcolm X collection. And I could draw many parallels between Malcolm X and my own work. Remember, this was relatively early in my career as a manuscript curator, and I was still developing a professional moral compass. I did not really fully understand that when one repository attempts to build and strengthen its collections, we are all potentially facilitating loss by tearing down the agency of others. In my view, Columbia was the repository I cheered for. We had great faculty in African-American studies, such as Manny Marable and others. We deserved the papers. We had the scholarship to support them. We possessed the financial wherewithal to support their stewardship and conservation. And later, most ironically, I would wind up at the Schomburg Center as Director of Collections and Services. And there I understood why it was important for the Malcolm X papers to be housed at the Schomburg in the nexus of the Harlem community. Indeed, place and context mattered. Mm -hmm. 
You can say that my younger curator did not know what I did not know. Losing or loss in this case was not the characteristic relationship that an Ivy League manuscript repository Tory normally felt in its own skin. But Columbia Rare Book and Manuscript Repository was an Ivy League library who was no stranger to loss. In 1994, the repository discovered the theft of nearly $1.8 million in rare books, letters, and manuscripts. The eventual culprit would be Daniel Spiegelman, who over a three-month period tunneled his way into the rare book vault by removing a section of the wall in Butler Library and using an abandoned book lift, he went into the vault multiple times. This epic tale of theft of manuscripts and rare books is chronicled in the book Thief, the true crimes of Daniel Spiegelman. While Columbia emerged from this drama lauded as an advocate for safekeeping, of special collections. By the time I began working there as an archivist and later a manuscript curator, I could tell the traumatic situation left an indelible mark on the psyche of my colleagues. The Columbia RBML again experienced the trauma of loss when the beat poet Allen Ginsberg personal archives, journals, tapes, letters, and poems in progress, newspapers and, and even beard clippings landed at Stanford University Library after being housed at Columbia for 25 years. Ginsburg shopped the papers on the market. Columbia did not budge on its bid. Stanford offered him $1 million, which he could not refuse. The papers that were the natural organic product of Ginsburg's life as a Columbia student his adventures in East Village, everything that rendered him a New Yorker wound up in an unlikely place in California. This was considered by many of my colleagues to be a misstep and a loss of organizational memory for Columbia. A trusted source shared with me that Ginsburg would have given the papers to Columbia and it's changed, sorry, that it should not be there. <laughs> there you go. Ginsburg was playing a trick on us. Um, that Ginsburg actually wanted um, a, one, a million dollar apartment from Columbia. It's, it wasn't really a million dollars. Columbia um, had um, this wonderful system where the librarians who worked there could actually get housing. And I don't know if that's still the case or not, but really what he wanted was an apartment. And Columbia, refused to give him the apartment. So he ended up putting the papers on the market. And what I didn't know was that the papers of Ginsburg were actually at Columbia for 25 years. Um, so they were on deposit and they had them all this time. But here's the irony in that, is that um, this was in 1993 and Ginsburg died in 1997. Therefore, really he would have only been in the apartment for four years. And so, you know, the, the question is, was it really worth the decision um, that Columbia made not to, not to relinquish and allow him to have that apartment? The space of collecting is often a war zone in our business that can lead to losses. And by now, with some very high profile losses, Columbia understood this experience well. As curators, we were driven by the persistent desire to add and not subtract from our collections. We amassed a sizable processing backlog, which also constitutes a loss, loss of discovery, loss of access, but that did not deter us from possessing an appetite for collecting. We wanted to collect in a manner that was innovative, play to our strengths, such as the acquisition of the bomb um, magazine archives, and we challenged dominant historical perspectives with the social justice and activism focused perspective. With Bomb Magazine and the eventual acquisition of the Human Rights Watch archive at Columbia, a narrative characterized by winning and not loss was beginning to emerge. Duke University also vied for the Human Rights Collection. That repository had already established themselves as a leader in building collections related to human rights. For Columbia, this will be a new collecting focus 
but in our favor was our location in New York City, home to the headquarters of Amnesty International, as well as our excellent program in international affairs. We were told that we would have to develop a vision for the collection, which would include near, new curatorial positions and the establishment of a Center for Human Rights Documentation. Duke University accordingly was given the same assignment. In the end, Columbia did not lose, but won. We knew that this was of great historical significance for the repository. And for me, it's forever changed the archeology span of how I viewed myself as a collector. Moving forward to a much later time in my career, during the pandemic 2021, when I was associate university um, librarian for rare distinctive collections, we were approached by um, Quip Chief Lynn Malerba of the Mohegan tribe to repatriate the papers of Fidelia Fielding, one of the last fluent speakers of the Mohegan language. Columbia received, I mean, sorry, Cornell received this collection quite um, unintentionally. It was a part of a larger ag aggregate collection and this diary was contained in it. And I have to admit that when the chief first approached us with the letter um, to get the papers back, I began to put up my guard and this sense of wanting to keep something. But then I saw it, even though it was a loss for us, we had put resources into digitizing it. It became known to me that really, this was a chance where loss or losing something was the right thing to do. And here um, is a picture of me. Um, this was, like I said, during the pandemic, we had to do the exchange um, of the diary with the Mohegan tribe outdoors um, with our mask on. And these are the gifts that they gave Cornell. And I want to say um, this exchange was a two part exchange. First, um, they drove to Ithaca, New York um, to facilitate Fidelia's home, homecoming. And so she traveled in the wonderful box that um, the wonderful conservation team at Cornell um, built, especially for the diary. But later, um, almost, it seemed like nearly a year later, we were invited to come to Uncasville, Connecticut to the museum. And um, I'm even tearing up now to see Fidelia's papers at home for her own homecoming with the belt that she wore um, there was quite moving for me. And so um, you can view it in some ways as a loss of something that Cornell had, but I saw that as a gain and a win. And so I think that's one of the wonderful aspects that we're looking at in this conference is that loss doesn't necessarily always mean um, that you're losing something or that there's an emptiness afterwards. And these are more pictures of the ceremony that we attended. Now, back to the class I spoke of and why I talk of cake. Um, when I was taking this rare book school class, it was it was called um, advanced Administ learning advanced administration techniques and special collections. We were told by our instructors that a library and its collections are much like a cake. Every library is a cake made of layers. Cakes all usually have the same basic ingredients, sugar, flour, eggs, and this is what makes all library general circulating collections the same. You have the inside filling, which represents the core collections. However, it's your special and rare and distinctive collections that represents the outer, outer layer of frosting and the garnishment on top that makes each library unique. Your special collections cannot be duplicated anyplace else. And while two repositories can sh share the same strengths, for example, you can look at places such as the Kiel Center at Cornell, which is a labor management documentation archive, and the Tanamit Library at NYU, which also has significant special collections related to labor. However, neither has the same documents or approaches to documenting the history of labor in the same way.
Unfortunately, such comparisons entertain tropes of special collections as being the eye candy of a library and how collections and manuscript repositories are often what we trot out as a moving force to attract donors. Moreover, the analogy is additionally historically fraught because it creates dynamics of heritage and memory work as a mean of cultural consumption. It does not speak of how collections can give voice to silences or in certain narratives where they are missing or the precarious nature of labor within special collections. As libraries and the places that we work in, such as archives, we are curators and archivists, and we are expected to make the best case by acquiring the most expensive and attractive collections. The bigger, the better. Rare books are seen as a medium for aesthetics and volume counts. Often curators become what I call professional biblio shoppers. We don't approach collecting manuscripts related to cultural heritage in a way that encapsulates or a humbleness or understanding of the communities who create them. We approach acquiring with a single-mindedness never to lose, but when and when often. And um, this is actually um, a picture of um, something that was pretty extraordinary going on the theme of cake. Um, this was an event uh, at um, a Smithsonian that was sponsoring um, scholarship around books. And I posted this on Twitter at one time, but each person who was at the banquet received their very own individual cake. Um, and so I thought that was quite amazing. And that also made me think of this theme of this idea of special collections um, and the embellishments around them. In order to deconstruct such representations, we must recognize ourselves outside of these tropes. The global pandemic left us facing budget cuts and restraints on collecting. The New York Antiquarian Book Fair was actually the last normal event I attended before the lockdown. Before each book fair, I studied the catalogs and I contemplated my moves. I would walk into the rare book fair, kind of like a dog um, with its owner not holding his leash in a park, just ready to go after whichever tree I saw. <laughs> um, I never would go in with the intention of leaving empty handed. And the pandemic was mildly terrifying for many curators because rather than seeing our chief responsibility as stewards, we viewed it as collecting. I witnessed curators who suffered from professional biblio shopper withdrawal syndrome because libraries place moratoriums on acquisitions. How do we perhaps adopt an approach of lessness to effectively position ourselves as stewards? who have a better understanding of the place of collection we have already amassed within the resource ecosystem. We buy more when we have intellectual and cultural food at home within our vaults. What happens when we don't consume what is already in our refrigerator? We experience loss through wasted opportunities for intellectual nourishment. When we are approaching collecting on autopilot, we lose our sense of acquiring in intentional and meaningful ways. We have collections that are cast in amber, which represent a complexity of voices. During the pandemic, there was also the backdrop of political and social unrest. In response, we went into hyper collection mode, especially PWIs who began consuming BIPOC collections with much opacity around their intentions for community engagement. We were divorced from our own shortcomings because with our professional conviction and rigidity, we always feel a sense of winning, not losing, when we bring collections into our repositories. And we perpetuate loss when we no longer engage with the collections whose future we supposedly invested in by buying them. Every time you take in a collection, you impose your perspective, and we as memory keepers are the only ones left to vocalize the collection struggle. Gabrielle Marcel was a French philosopher who described the spirit of abstraction as the practice of conceiving people as functions rather than as human beings. Abstraction is also generalizing complex situations 
without acknowledging the gravity of the concepts that underlie them. We apply the same misunderstandings to our collections. Therefore, speaking to the title of this conference, an item not found. An item can exist simultaneously in being found and reside on our shelves and also be lost or not found. And this especially happens when we fail to ensure that we have um, remain, what we have remains intimately engaged as holistic repositories of stories. And this is where the power of lessness is important. There are immense benefits to self-appraising ourselves and basing our decisions in the construct of reality. Before purchasing something, ask if this addition to your archives is informing social, political, economic, or ecological narratives. Will this item remain deeply engaged in 20 years? <clears throat> what conversations will it inspire? Analyze your impulse to biblioshop, but approach from a knowledge sharing perspective. And these are my points for having our cake and research too. You know, number one, check yourself, collect with purpose and not privilege. Remember that many of the poorest community archives have some of the richest collections. Money does not prevent waste or loss of knowledge. Remember you are a curator. You're not a professional biblio shopper. Think of your found items as what you must interact with in your everyday professional life and how they continuously inform the research ecosystem. If you're buying just to show off, you're a biblio shopper and there's power in lessness. I'm gonna walk you through my process a little bit um, when I go through a, a book fair and how I'm constantly checking myself about how am I contributing to some of the problems when it comes to biblio shopping and hoarding and creating lostness. Um, this was a lot um, from the London Rare Book Fair. It was September, 2022. These were the purchases that I made and considering that um, it was very monumental for me because these are some of the first purchases I was doing as the director of the Smithsonian Libraries, which consists of 21 um, library research centers as well um, as a very large institutional archive. I knew um, the gravity and weight of what I was bringing into the collection because the curators and librarians we have already do an amazing job of bringing in collections with, which mirror the collections that we have on the museum um, on the material culture side. So one of the items I bought was Turnover Magazine, um, which was a magazine for the people's food system. I bought um, a very nice run of the Black Panther newspaper um, for the National Museum of African American History and Culture Library. I bought a case law on a dispute over rhubarb plants um, for our Coleman Library of Natural History, which contains um, many of our rare books related to national history. An artist book um, called Salad Pussy, um, and it went to um, our Cooper Hewitt Museum of Design Library. Black Panther News Service especially stood out for me because um, our um, African-American museum, as you know, is fairly young. Um, in Smithsonian terms, it was um, built, I think it opened in 2016, and the collections that Shauna Collier was building, I knew did not have any newspapers within them, and so I saw this as something that was really rare um, and special to, to bring in, and I was really pleased when um, they actually arrived in my office and Secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, happened to be visiting me, and he was like, wow, these are really amazing. And so that was something that I thought that I was contributing um, in a very good way to the collections that we were building. The Turnover Magazine um, of Politics and Food, uh, I'm going to be honest, a lot of times we collect um, in ways that mirror our own perspectives. I'm a child of the 70s. And I really like the fact that this was a grassroots publication that um, was about food justice and that um, 
the people who created it did it um, on very minimal budget, but the uh, but the articles were so provocative. And it and for those of you out there who are Gen X kids who remember the Oscar Mayer wieners and the bologna, and those are the very processed foods that were being shoved at us through the commercials that we're seeing, Kraft macaroni and cheese, cheese whiz, all of that stuff. And what I noticed was that a lot of the issues that turnover um, would cover, and you see this is from 1977, are still very much um, living with us today. I decided that this publication would go to our Anacostia Community Museum because um, the director, of um, the museum, Dr. Melanie Adams, was very interested um, in food justice. And there was a wonderful exhibit in July of 2022 that was about um, food and production and how that affects um, minority communities, especially things like food deserts. So we believe that that found a really good home. I'm sorry. Now the rhubarb piece. Um, I, um, unbeknownst to a lot of people, started off in law libraries and not special collections, and I have a, um, a deep interest in um, collecting um, materials related to law, and this was something that um, I brought from um, Brian Kinmont, and it was a case study about um, a case that was made against a party who accused the other party of delivering the wrong type of rhubarb plant. And um, so this case is a comprehensive study of, of that. So I'm gonna walk you through when I brought this back um, from England and um, showed it to Leslie Overstreet, who was a curator for Coleman. She gave me a curious look and she said, well, we normally don't collect law um, at the Smithsonian, even though she could understand why, because of natural history, me, um, museum collects a lot about botany um, and plants and things. And I said, I said, okay. And so I thought maybe I shouldn't have got this. And she said, let me sit with this for a while. And so I wanted to just share with you um, her comments to me la later. She said, Tamar, I've taken a good look at the rebarb legal document and I find that it fits the Coleman collection. So I'm happy to accept it. Although the focus of the document as a whole is a law case, the debate incorporates an interesting discussion about the plan itself. The middle section presents historical and botanical descriptions of rhubarb species and varieties and their respective sources, referencing published travels into Russia and the Levant, with several of which Smithsonian libraries and archives holds. And even more importantly, the botanical taxonomies of Tornifold, Mathioli, Dioscorides, Pomet and others whose work SLA also holds. So it, I found it interesting that it was kind of this, um, I guess, different ways of that both of us were looking at how this collection could be um, important um, to our co the collections that we were bringing in. And I felt very pleased with her very thorough assessment of that. And also I wanted to say that the Smithsonian, we are always um, considering ourselves as, um, in, as stewards of, for our collections. And we have a large committee for shared stewardship. And we really do think thoughtfully about um, the things that we're bringing in. And you know, we say sometimes that there is no loss in cultural heritage work because we never get rid of everything. And this is again, where abstraction presents itself. We have old collections with this, which have not been reimagined within the framework of modern research. Our approach to collecting is always like a fingerprint. It's distinctly ours, and we have to use that power wisely. The collections we care for come us to the tragedy of loss when we fail to bring life into them. And so I want to end with this key ring that I keep with me every day. Um, really, I bought it because I have a really horrible habit of buying Grubhub or DoorDash when I have lots of food in my refrigerator and things go to waste. I'm a busy woman and sometimes I don't have time to cook, but I'm also kind of using it as um, just a vehicle to remind me to think about the collections that we have in our vault that we're not looking at rather than bringing, bringing other things in and lessness being the new ethics. 
you know, we must be free of this compulsion to acquire um, and again, use the collections we have and not neglect them because that way they are lo really lost. Um, every collection is equally important and the collections you find are found items and they deserve dignity and mobility. And ending again with my question, what was an article that you found in your archive that moved you? So thank you very much. And I really want to say that I hope this conference um, that you have an enjoyable time and think about what kind of revolution that this will inspire to take place. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar, for that incredibly rich and thought-provoking talk. Um, we do have time for a few questions. So those of you in the audience, um, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A feature. We'll, we'll pick them up and share them with Tamar. Um, we do have one, uh, which I can uh, read to you. It's a question about hyper-collecting. Um, so uh, the question, um, reads, the various positions within special collections have dramatically changed as I have observed them since the advent of social media. People vie to be curators so they can get attention in a way that they didn't before they could use collections on social media for unboxing parts of attention getting. Um, I used to be a curator and now I'm a cataloger and I've seen a lot of folks purchase a number of items I imagine will need to be deaccessioned later as a way of showing their power to buy on social media. How much do you think social media has changed this power buying landscape? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, and I mean, thank you for that. One that I haven't even really considered. I mean, I know that during the pandemic, one thing that I was a, a bit shocked at was that, you know, when we were going through this period of racial unrest, uh, people losing family, family members, you know, really a great depression the frenzy that some curators were going through when they could not buy anything as though they were going through these withdrawal sy syndromes. And there were actually lots of book dealers doing Zoom auctions <laughs> and webinars around that. And you would see a lot of books showing up on special collect, I mean on social media and bidding around it. And you know, I want to I want to say that I support the rare book trade and book sellers all over. Um, I, I, you know, I really adore Ian Kahn and, um, and many Jonathan Hill and many of the other dealers I work with. And I understand that it was important for them to also make a living. Um, and I also view them as curators as, as well, because I think they very thoughtfully um, take in books in order for them to be things that will be useful for us to buy in our collections. So I'm in no way putting the onus on the book dealers to not bring things to the book fair and not, and not coax us into buying things. But I think the rise of the professional biblio shopper came out of the, these ideas of competition. If you're a curator and you feel that your main objective is to just collect and, and buy, then you have it all wrong. Um, and you need to, as I say, say, check yourself, you know, the, the word really means to, to steward, to care for. Nowhere in that does it really say it, that to collect things. And I think that's where the shift needs to come from. I use social media as a tool to amplify um, the collections in my repositories. We do so with the Smithsonian libraries and archives. Erin Rushing, our outreach librarian, is always amplifying the things that we have. And, and that's interesting too about the Smithsonian is that, you know, we rarely post about our new acquisitions. I've worked at a lot of places who do, but um, I think, you know, that's a good point about social media. We should really use it more to give these collections um, some light that we've kept in the darkness. Thank you. Um... I, uh, I actually have a question for you, <laughs> um, if you would be willing to answer this. Um, I really appreciate your openness about how your approach to collecting developed over time, um, but also um, how you were able to influence your, the organizations you were in at the time to move in your direction. And so I was wondering if you would be um, able to say more about like what strategies you used to do that and what advice you might have for other people who might 
similarly like to kind of change their organization's mindset? Um, I, I, I could have talked about more losses in, 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 in the presentation and because there are some curators that I did not influence much at, at all. Um, you know, I've, I've, for instance, there was one example where um, I knew a curator who basically would just buy something just because they were doing a presentation. And we're talking about books that cost over $5,000. Um, if I, I saw some who, you know, would buy up ends of maybe 30 books a month because they had those deep pockets and those endowments. And that's when um, I kind of thought of this whole idea of the professional biblio shopper, because I didn't really see any rhyme or reason to what was coming, coming in. One day it would be a book about bees. The next day it would be a book about French cufflinks or some, something like that. And, and um, I didn't really understand their process. I always control what I can control. Um, and I always do that in a way that I let other people know. And I also collaborate with people like yourself, um, like the messages that this conference is, is, you know, trying to send and just amplifying that. And, and I think in the end, those messages always rise to the top like cream. I, I would hope so. Though I don't think we made much of a dent in the rush to collect BIPOC collections after the George Floyd incident. You know, we did a lot of buying, we did a lot of hiring of brown faces um, and people, but I'm not hearing a lot about what was the result of that. Where are those collections being used now? Where, you know, the revolution is not just buying the stuff. You have to actually do something with it. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got another question um, about advocacy. Um, the, the question states, I appreciated your thoughts on processing backlog as loss. How do you advocate for staff? Um, and funds to aid processing since donors and ad admin often um, do not care as much about um, those functions as others, some others possibly. I, I always, um, especially as an AUL, um, advocated that whenever we would take in a collection, we would ask for processing money for it. I, I um, There were a few times when Cornell praised me for, for, for doing that. Um, I would I would explain to the donor that you know the life cycle of a collection coming to the repository just doesn't end with the donation, um, and would show them the effects of you know conservation, not having conservation, and also the importance that you know discovery of that collection is in the life cycle as well. What what bothers me a little about you know the processing and arrangement description is that those are where some of our largest um, I kind of like epidemics of precarious work lie. And we have to think about ways of putting in frameworks that make this a normal part of the job and not just project work um, ar ar around this. And um, another problematic issue is, is grants, working with granting agencies around project work especially when you're looking at hidden collections and, and, and backlogs. Um, I'm going to just do a little pitch here. Um, some people may have seen me ask questions on Twitter about this. I'm really, um, one of my goals in this career is to establish a fund to help people who are underemployed and underemployed, and also to set up more networks for people who need jobs, permanent jobs to get them. Because I really think that this problem is only going to end with us around it. And we're always bringing in collections, which means we always need things to be processed. Um, things always need nat metadata when they go into the digitization life cycle phase. So how can we make these jobs permanent and just as important as many of the the permanent curatorial positions that we have in our repositories. Yeah. 
you're muted. Sorry. Um, I was saying that, thank you very much for addressing this. There's actually several questions kind of related to this topic of um, the relationship between um, the different functions in the library and, and how to make sure they all get resources. Um, so thank you for, for tackling that. We have, um, there's an, uh, another question um, that I will toss to you. You touched a lot on the commodification of cultural material. Do you think there will be any change or will there be an increase of monetization from cultural heritage? That's a good question. Um, and one that, so now that I'm at the Smithsonian, I, I'm, you know, this is a museum, library and archive. I'm seeing things from a different angle because so, a lot of the collections that we get, if it's a manuscript collection or archives are actually given to us. Um, it was also the same way at the Schomburg. And a lot of the commodification I saw happened in a lot of the Ivy League libraries I worked at. And understand that I have a I have actually a limited lens in that I'm called Ebony and Ivy because I worked in six Ivy League institutions. Um, that's just um, I'm I'm actually the opposite of Athena Jackson, who worked in a lot of Big Ten um, in, institutions. So I worked in the places where I, I where the the endowment pockets were the deepest a, a, a around that. And the only way place I stepped out of that world for a little bit was when I was um, executive director of the Black Metropolis Research Consortium. But even then there were people who were African-American, um, especially who that legacy of those papers were all they had and they needed, they needed the funding. Um, when I was at the Schomburg Center, I went out to appraise the James Baldwin papers. The asking price for that was 2.5 million, but that was his legacy. And um, I don't think anyone faulted them um, for asking for that. So I think this is a very complex issue with no easy answers. But what I think we can, um, again, control, which, which is, you know, you, again, I think you have to control what you can is the bidding um, between um, repositories and think of ways to approach this collaboratively. As is the Getty Research Institute in the Smithsonian around the Johnson Pub um, the Johnson Publication Archives. Thank you. Um, one more. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so. Uh, Tamar, thanks for calling out the robber barons and professional biblio shoppers. What thoughts do you have for how lower resourced institutions can also better appreciate and breathe life into their collections, which are often closed? Closed due to, I'm, um, gonna, I'm gonna assume it's lack of discovery. It might be, or perhaps also um, due to policies about use? Right. Um, I mean, my greatest experience was with community archives who often are struggling just to keep lights on. And, you know, one thing that, um, I mean, and I'm actually going to throw a question back out to the audience. We, we, we talk a lot about precarious work and how um, for, you need to get paid for internships and things like that. When I was a student at Simmons, we had to do internships as part of our graduate work from um, my MS LIS degree, and um, we were not paid, and that was expected. There are many community archives who are suffering now because they don't have the funding to pay um, for volunteers and interns, and they're really um, noticing that loss. So, I think this is, again, a place where larger institutions can partner with community archives and actually take up some of the, that price and pay the interns to work um, in, in community ar archives. Um, I've never met a community archivist, by the way, who was really a biblio shopper. I have met some who were hoarder, more <laughs> hoarders in that they were saving everything and needed to de develop a better sense of what has enduring value 
and what's archival. And again, I think that's a place where they we can help them. Um, just quick story. Um, one of one of the things that saddened me the most was when I was in Chicago working for the BMRC and this person felt that they had this huge archive. And when we went in there, it was basically all ebony magazines and just newspaper clippings of things that were in other places. And they really put their life into cataloging this um, and, and everything. And, and of course it wasn't open to the public. So um, I think we all need to just be better advocates about educating everyone holistically in this. Sorry, that was long-winded. No, it was, I, everything you're saying is inspiring um, a lot of kind of um, very generative um, feedback and further questions. And so um, we've got uh, one more, um, one last question, um, which I think is also kind of coming out of a lot of the things that you've been talking about. So really appreciate that you are um, willing to share. Um, so much of your expertise on this. Um, the question is, if you work for one of those institutions where the valuation of your labor is often hung on the shininess and reputation of new acquisitions, how can technical services folks gain more traction in motivating curatorial staff to collaborate on redescriptive or reparative projects that involve older acquisitions? Right. Um, so when I was at Cornell University, one of the things I did with the um, rare book and manuscript collections division there was create um, something that was called um, curatorial collections um, council. So that was a council of everyone at, Col at Cornell who had a special collection in their repository so they could come together to make collaborative decisions about what they had and what they were bringing in. Um, but also I created a, another curatorial leadership team within um, the rare repository that included technical services people. Um, and so, so the curators could be cognizant of the burdens of what they were bringing in and how that affected them. I'm not gonna name a repository, <laughs> repository but I was on a, an interview once where um, and you know how it is in interviews, they have you meet with teams, with stakeholder teams, and one stakeholder team was the curators, the other stakeholder team was the technical services, and the first thing they said to me is, what can we do to stop the curators from being a collecting machine? They said, because they have no idea the burden of backlog that this is putting on us, and so the two groups were not speaking to one another. I think someone who's trying to remedy that should go to their director of special collections or their AUL and say, you know, we need something to create a balance and we need to again, look at the life cycle of these, of these collections. Um, because again, that's loss. If you're just buying a lot of stuff, um, I can guarantee you that no one is really looking at all of it at any one time. And we have to stop ourselves from, you know, dare I say it, of bringing in future discards or trash. I mean, we've all worked in a repository where someone has said, I don't know what this person was thinking of 20 years ago when this came in. And, and you know, Anna, maybe I was in danger of being that person with the rhubarb piece, you know, because when Leslie first looked at me, I thought, oh God, I went, I like, I like strawberry rhubarb pie. I like food. You know, I love rhubarb. I thought I like law. This was interesting, but I really thought her response to me was thoughtful that that she really thought of it and she kept it. And I was not going to make her keep it if she didn't want to. Yeah, um, rhubarb is yummy. Um, and and thank you for um, for uh, ending your Q and A on this lovely note <laughs> about rhubarb. Um, Thank you so much for your time, Tamar, um, and and for your generosity in um, sharing your expertise with us. It is um, really an honor to have you open our conference. Um, and thank you to those of you in the audience for your time as well and your questions and your feedback. Um, let us take a short break and we'll be back at 1015 Pacific and 115 Eastern with our first panel of the conference. So see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tamar.